the Exxon Valdez, 11 million gallons. The Gulf War, 240 million gallons. The Ixtoc oil well, 400 million gallons. The Amoco Cadiz, 68 million gallons. The big spills get the media's attention, yet such catastrophic oil spills are relatively rare. What happens more often with little media attention are smaller spills. Every year there are thousands of spills of less than 500 gallons each, yet they account for only 1% of the total volume of oil spilled. There are hundreds of spills in the 500 to 50,000 gallon range. Large spills of more than 50,000 gallons are relatively few, but account for nearly two-thirds of all the oil spilled. Spills occur as a result of natural events, equipment failure, and human error. On land, there may be highway accidents involving tank trucks or railway accidents involving tank cars. Pipelines or storage tanks may fail. There may be accidents during loading and unloading operations. On water, vessels may ground or collide, or underwater pipelines may fail. Onshore or offshore, there may be blowouts during drilling operations. Flammable and toxic gases may also be released. Persons may be injured or trapped. While cleanup of spilled oil has been a concern for many years, the issue was brought into sharp focus by the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, which increased liability for companies that handle and transport oil. The act requires facilities, ports, and carriers to prepare a contingency plan for response to various scenarios, up to and including a worst-case discharge in adverse weather. The National Contingency Plan establishes special response forces and authorizes federal spill response. Since the implementation of OPA 90, the number of large spills has decreased. When a spill occurs, responders must prevent ignition of the spill, stop the flow of oil, limit the environmental impact, and remove and properly dispose of the spill in a safe manner. This is the first program in the Oil Spill Response Series, and it is entitled Initial Response. It is designed to provide training and assistance to personnel who are called upon to control and clean up oil spills. This program will cover the hazards of oil spills, issues pertaining to size up, site control, responder safety, and strategy and tactics for initial response to a spill will be discussed. When a spill of persistent oil is not cleaned up, natural weathering over an extended period of time may reduce the amount of oil in the environment. But a layer of oil may still be visible and oil beneath the surface quite fresh. These areas may eventually recover. Major ecological impact occurs early in the spill when the oil is most toxic and fluid. Vegetation and animal life may be adversely impacted. But if the spill is quickly cleaned up using non-intrusive measures, recolonization of most species is rapid. In addition to the beneficial effects on indigenous organisms, the public, the media, and government regulations require cleanup action. The majority of spills occur on land, Pipeline leaks are often serious spills. Storage tanks may leak or fail. Tank trucks may be involved in accidents. Tank cars may derail. There may be accidents during fueling or product transfer. Many spills which originate on water end up stranded on the shoreline. This is the second program in a series called Oil Spill Response. It is entitled 
countermeasures on land and is designed to provide training and assistance to personnel who are called upon to clean up oil spills. This program will cover cleanup of inland spills as well as spills on water that reach the shoreline. Subjects to be covered include spill behavior, control activities, basic spill countermeasures, the potential impact of treatment methods, and safety precautions for cleanup personnel. When oil spills on water, responders are presented with a series of challenges. Adverse weather and sea conditions can make the work extremely difficult. Currents can spread oil at a rapid rate. The water itself is a hazard which constantly moves and changes. A number of different countermeasures may be required. This is the third program in the Oil Spill Response Series, and it is entitled Countermeasures on Water. It is designed to provide training and assistance to personnel who respond to and clean up oil spills. This program will discuss how oil weathers when spilled on water, how the response effort is managed, countermeasures for spills on water, and basic safety precautions for response personnel. When hydrocarbons spill on water, the product begins to change, a process called weathering. Light ends begin to evaporate. Polar solvents like methanol and alcohol readily dissolve in water. Other hydrocarbons do not, even when mixed. Once agitation stops, the oil and water separate. Agitation by wind and heavy seas can emulsify the oil. Water emulsified in oil, sometimes called mousse, may contain 50 to 80 percent water and have a pale brown color and grease-like consistency. Oil droplets may also adhere to planktonic organisms and silt. Other weathering processes include biodegradation by microorganisms and oxidation, which produce compounds that are water-soluble. Loss of light ends increases the oil's viscosity and specific gravity. Some sinking may occur. If these heavy residual components reach the bottom, further degradation is extremely slow. Significant resources have been committed to remove the oil spill from the environment. But a sizable amount of waste remains. The ability to handle the recovered oil and other wastes resulting from the cleanup effort will be an important factor in determining the success of the spill response. This is the fourth program in the oil spill response series, and it is entitled waste management. It is designed to provide training and assistance to personnel who are called upon to clean up oil spills and handle the waste resulting from the cleanup effort. The program will examine waste management priorities, temporary storage methods for bulk oil, oil water separation, and disposal and reclamation methods for oily wastes. Managing waste should be an important part of contingency planning and should not become an issue of contention at the time of an incident. Planning for and carrying out proper waste management is an important part of the response effort. Waste management activities must be integrated within the unified command organization and are normally handled by the environmental unit within the planning section. Determining how and where to dispose of the oil and other waste material must be part of the plan. Waste management activities may be carried out by personnel separate from those who were engaged in the oil spill response. Nevertheless, response personnel must understand and appreciate the problems of waste management. 
Waste minimization and proper segregation of waste streams are everyone's concern. Successful waste management can result in sizable cost savings to the responsible party. Response activities must be carried out in a way that minimizes the amount of waste generated. The waste encountered may contain hazards to human health. Therefore, the risks must be evaluated and appropriate protective clothing and equipment provided to cleanup workers. Whenever oil or a hazardous material spills, there is potential for severe environmental damage and substantial economic impact. The situation is complex. Response operations may be required using a vast number of resources. An important issue is how these resources are organized and managed. This program is part of the Oil Spill Response Series and is called ICS and Unified Command. It is designed to provide training and assistance to personnel involved in spill response. Ship southbound heading to the north, tell them we got a lot of diesel fuel on the water. They're going to have to do something to stop that ship or slow it down. It's going to go right through the spill. The program will identify the key players involved in spill response. Describe the basic organization established at most responses. Describe the relationship of federal, state, and private sector officials. And explain how decisions are made in unified command. What you got, Captain? Well, we got this uh, hazardous cargo, uh, number 2049. A key player is the responsible party, whose obligation it is to contain, recover, and dispose of the oil. Initially, the responsible party may be represented by a facility manager, a vessel captain, or a qualified individual who has authority to initiate response operations. Subsequently, there may be an incident commander who takes over leadership of the responsible party spill management team. Go ahead. We have oil essentially in the channels that surround Harbor Island. Another key player is the Federal On-Scene Coordinator, or FOSC, a pre-designated individual who, under the National Contingency Plan, is responsible for ensuring the immediate and effective removal of a discharge. The OSC comes from the U.S. Coast Guard when the discharge involves vessels, from the Environmental Protection Agency for other discharges. <laughs> 